Welcome to We're Libertarians Daily Podcast. I am your host, Hody Johns, and I have with me Erica Denise Payne. Erica, how's it going today? Going good. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Uh, we've been friends for a while. This is our first time actually having a live interaction. I'd say yeah. face to face, but you're still through, through the computer. So I still have that sense of I can say whatever I want without getting smacked. <laughs> I don't condone violence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you nap believer, but we're, you. But we are going to see each other soon in person, so. Oh, so I better, I better tone down exactly how wild I decided to go <laughs> You're not free yet. Right. <laughs> so, the cam- <laughs> no, the camping trip will be fun. Uh, but Erica is not only a friend of mine, but she is a pioneer in the subject of permaculture. Uh, so Erica, I believe that 99% of the people, uh, in this audience heard that word for the first time as it left my lips just now. So would you like (laughs) to explain what permaculture is? Sure. So to me, permaculture is like an umbrella term. It's, it, it's a combination. It's an umbrella term for a bunch of different concepts. Um, how you structure your garden, how you, um, how you water your plants, how you, um, how you compost. It's an umbrella term because there's so many different manifestations of how it happens, but essentially it's a philosophy in gardening and it goes against what, uh, big pharma is doing with monoculture, um, where everything is planted in rows. They use chemical fertilizers. They use, um, water that, you know, who knows where they get it. So it, it, it's just basically, um, a philosophy for gardening that goes against the grain. And, um, like I said, there's lots of manifestations of how this can go. The way I've thought of it, it kind of goes with the grain and it seems like the monoculture goes against the grain. Uh, Yeah. In in a natural way of speaking. I know what you were saying. Really, really it's, that's the, the, that's correct. But, um, I guess because everybody seems to get their food from big ag, it's Mm -hmm. like more farmer, farmers are more popular, I guess, Uh, subsidized farmers are popular. So uh, that's kind of why I said it the way I did is just, um, but this is in my mind, it's against the grain because when people, when you ask someone, okay, how do you plant a garden? They'll tell you, okay, you need to till the ground. You need to put, seeds in the ground, cover it, put some chemical fertilizer over it and water it. But they don't, there's no, I don't know. It just seems very unnatural to me. And I don't know. It, it, there's better ways of doing things. <laughs> sure. sure. So let's, I mean, let, let's, let me make your argument important real quick. The first time I came across the word permaculture is when I was, um, I, I was looking into farm subsidies and how we would turn this land in um, Florida, which was great for growing oranges, the best oranges in the world, and how they were using it to grow cotton instead. And cotton wasn't the ideal thing to grow there. It, didn't, it, it grew second-rate cotton and first-rate tomatoes. But because we paid the farmers their X amount of money, taxpayer money, of course, to grow cotton they had to do things well they said well florida you know oranges grow here and they're awesome and they'll grow naturally but you know we're getting paid to grow a second rate plant and so we have to do these things to try and make that second rate plant work and so it was the monoculture guys against the permaculture guys and Mm -hmm. just so right off the bat i kind of at least had a a healthy love of permaculture because i said well if we can grow the best oranges in the world why would we settle for growing second-rate cotton when we could grow the best oranges in the world that seems like there's right. a demand for that yeah that's a a big issue is subsidies the government wants a certain crop from a certain farm and and the i think the worst part is that they have these farmers they have these huge fields and like, like really large pieces of land that they're using for one crop like just one and it causes soil depletion like it's really bad for the environment, specifically that little patch of land that they're, you know, that they're operating on. But if if they were to grow many different crops within that small space, or I say small, but it's like huge patches of land. But if they were to grow multiple different crops within that space and break outside of the traditional rows and 
I really think it would benefit the soil. They wouldn't have to use things like chemical fertilizers. They wouldn't have like so many problems would be solved if they would just switch it up and crop rotate so that uh, the certain as you rotate your crops, the soil is benefited from each thing that the plant that you're growing has or can provide your soil. Um, the most important part in my mind is soil health. You want to keep your soil alive and moving and um, with lots of little creepy crawlies and worms and things like that. And you want to keep the nutrients level up, but that doesn't happen if you're growing one crop every year, <laughs> it just gets depleted. Sure. You've you brought up so much to unpack here and I think challenged so much of the status quo, which is, again, you did correctly use the term against the grain. I was just making a joke. <laughs> but, the, you know, I think the visualization that I get from you, I, I remember my grandma's garden and it being beautiful. There's tomatoes and basil over here and onions over here. And, and there was a couple corn stalks that she planted. It was just like everything was, was you know, it, there was so much involved and it looked so pretty. Um, and, and there was a lot going on versus what you're talking about. Again, that big agriculture, everything's a single, mm -hmm. single row. So let me, I'm going to ask some very specific questions because I, I know how I, the skeptic would come at it. Um, I hear chemical. I don't automatically think of something negative. So, right. So, right. So what makes the chemicals that, that they use in big ag worse than the natural creepy crawly dead bodies ecosystem that goes on there? Well, they're, first of all, they're unnecessary um, because you can attain it naturally. There's there's no need to fertilize. It's unnecessary from the beginning. And then um, for me, I'm not like a huge expert on what, you know, chemicals that are used. But to me, it just seems like why would you use like, why would you use something when you could just get it from your plants and get it from the way that you structure your bed? Because um, I, I also, I don't associate chemicals with bad. It's just, it depends on what they're using. And we'd have to go step by step through each chemical that they're using for me to kind of discern what is really bad. Like, I would be upset if I found something. Like, if I found that the farmer that was growing my local crops was using, like, some kind of hormone or something that's really toxic to us, I'd be really upset. And I have heard cases where certain farms use really toxic things in order to get a bigger plant or, or a bigger crop. And it just, it seems unnecessary. You could attain that naturally. So yeah, I, I do, because I, I'm not super knowledgeable on exactly which chemical is being used by which farms and which crops and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, it but it's an unnecessary <laughs> step. It's like getting a vaccination yeah. for a disease that's eradicated. <laughs> it's not that we're anti-vax. It's just if the disease is already eradicated and it no longer exists in the world, why risk, you know, why risk putting some aluminum into your body over it? You know, like, right. You might as it's, well avoid it. Yeah, it's super unnecessary. And there are ways through permaculture that we can address these issues. Like, um, you don't have to um, you don't have to resort to something artificial like why wouldn't we go with something natural that's sort of my my philosophy behind it sure so so let's talk about let's challenge tilling the field obviously okay. that's what we think of when we start off with they they till it they dig you know they plant their rows versus you and I've actually seen you uh, if you're watching this uh, you can actually see the her her uh, her blog uh, listed right above her there but uh the earth nerd anarchist dot home dot blog is where you can follow along with her and actually see her put this into action but uh mm -hmm. and so in in yours you've uh you've actually just added dirt on top of the existing so soil so just just describe why you would do that so i do not my preferred method or manifestation of permaculture is the no dig method. So I don't like, which tilling, I don't know why they call it no dig, but it's no tilling, you know, we're not tilling the ground. Okay. So basically what I what we've done is we've laid down a layer of newspaper, which I you don't really have to do. I think the dirt itself would, um, it will snuff the grass and the weeds and everything, but it does help to add an additional layer if you want to. We So we put um, a raised bed, and then a layer of newspaper, the soil on top, 
And then the plan is once we finish putting the plants in there to put a layer of compost and a layer of straw on top. And all of those things will break down as time goes on and go into the soil and it will draw worms and creepy crawlies and good bacteria that we want in our plants. So I, I like that method, but I mean, I like all the methods of permaculture. So <laughs> <laughs> that's just one I was like, oh, that's, that's easy. Let's do that one. We'll so there's, try not, that one. there's not like a single uh, tyrannical consensus on permaculture. Then. No, like, oh, okay. no, no. It's, it, you know, you just find out what works for you and your plot of land, basically. Um, like there's, you could go with Hugo culture. I always have trouble saying that Hugo culture, um, that basically you dig a trench in the ground, you throw in some logs or like dead trees, prunings from those trees, and you cover it with dirt and then compost. And basically you do that in fall and then um, throughout the winter, as those trees start to break down, they will suck up all the water they can find and your plants can actually access them by the time you plant them. It can actually access the water from the trees inside your little pile. <laughs> so, so you're kind of creating an ecosystem in a sense here. Right. You're controlling cool. your who gets what when it's pretty cool right you're working with an existing ecosystem i guess mm -hmm. it would be but but kind of accentuating it in a specific area so let me ask this then and, and I, this is just maybe as basic basic as it gets how do you not have all these bad weeds leaching off of your crops well the thing is for me and a lot of other people i watch a lot of homesteaders on youtube and I'm not afraid of weeds <laughs> because of the way that I like to plant. I like to keep plants clo close together. So there's not a whole lot of room for them. And what weeds do come up, th there's maybe one or two like this. I like to pack them in there. So there's maybe room for one or two weeds to come up, maybe a dandelion or something. And that's but, in your whole, in your whole plot, like the one that you yeah. showed me or on your blog. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. That's a so big area to only have one or two weeds. Right. So, okay. and maybe some grass comes up, but I'm not so much concerned about that because the main focus with that soil is going to be for the plants. Like they're going to get the most water. They're going to get the most, you know, everybody gets fertilized. So I'm not too concerned about weeds um, like you would be if you were monoculture gardening or um, just traditional gardening. I'm, I'm not super worried about it. Um, because you don't have to be, you don't really have to be. Um, and something you can do that I like is called chop and drop. So you basically like, like you either pull up whatever weed there is and you just drop it. Like you just leave it there and it will bring nutrients back into the soil that it maybe stole from the other plant. So it's the, the dead weed is providing fertilizer and mulch for the plant you want to grow. Sure. Well, I think even, I mean, the Lion King, if you're five years old, you're familiar with the circle of life a little bit, right? And that's yeah. kind of what you're using is saying, instead of having to go outside and feed it more of this external food, mm -hmm. it's it's got food in there. I'm just going to allow that circle of life to kind of work. Yeah. So yeah. you're you're kind of speeding it up because you're killing the wheat, but yeah. <laughs> it does provide <laughs> whatever you put in there. I don't like using wood chips because it will... Um, it will bruise the stems of your plants, specifically like basil, um, tomatoes, like they have really sensitive stems. So the best thing I like to use is either chop and drop, like whatever weeds come in there, grass clippings. Um, straw is a really popular one because it provides nutrients as it breaks down. I mean, they all do, but something about straw is just like, it really works and it becomes a part of that soil and enriches it. So it, it's a really popular one because it's already dying. So mm -hmm. maybe because it's already dying, people like it better. I don't know. But yeah, well, let's, um, let, let's talk briefly about uh, the politics of it a little bit. I know for me, I have a, a certain reason why I, I I'm, I, I'm interested in permaculture. I can't lie and say that I've active, actively practiced it. You've recommended a couple of books to me. I follow your blog. This is kind of why I'm getting into it. 
is I want to learn more about it because there is a freedom element associated with it. Being able mm-hmm. to have your own food that is self-sustaining that you don't have to pay for all the time <laughs> gets you off of a big agricultural system that the government wants you to depend on. Mm-hmm. And so if you can have a food source, even if it's just some food, start there. And for me, I started with herbs. So, and, and so this is my actual gardening experience. I won't lie and say it was permaculture, although my next one will be. Uh, we're hitting the springtime here, and so I, I'm, I'm excited to do some more planting. But uh, uh, herbs, and I was scared at first. I just didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. But as soon as I started, they sprouted real quick. I mean, we're talking all of, all of the seeds I planted were up above the, uh, uh, you know, I guess cresting the ground. There's probably some complex green term for that, but, you know, <laughs> uh, blossoming or whatever within a month. Yeah. And then, and then I got to harvest them within the month after that. I mean, they were just such healthy little guys. Um, we actually, um, I've got my basil plant and we used him <laughs> for some, uh, for, for some pasta today. Uh, nice. yeah. And so, yeah. And, and he's great because I trim his leaves, but there is actually little leaves that grow where you trim the leaves off. So it kind of tells you when you can trim. And yeah. so I, that's, that's basil. I don't have to buy from the store. Now, the funny thing is this whole thing started out off because my Walmart next to me constantly runs out of them. I constantly oh. don't have herbs and I cook all the time and I cook with herbs all the time. I think we've talked about it before. I love Mediterranean food and that's oh, yeah, very, it's very herby. And very adds, aromatic food. Right. And it adds so much flavor. And so when it's like, oh, you just, just do your uh, tzatziki without dill. I'm like, oh, you can't do you. that. <laughs> right. F, yeah. There's no way. That's not possible. I'm not going to do that. So, so nope. for me, like, it, it's just been a very liberating uh, position in, in order to say, like, I know where I can get my herbs from consistently. Mm-hmm. Now, the next step, obviously, would be growing more of those, um, you know, those staples, the tomatoes and the, and the corn and everything like that. But this is one of those things that just per, per, the reason that I find permaculture to be necessary or at least at least worth considering when you're considering a life of liberty. Did you want to comment on anything I said or add more? Well, I, I definitely, I agree with you. I think it's, a, first of all, I think herbs is a great place to start mm-hmm. because for like herbs are expensive. Like if you go into the grocery store and try to buy them, they're ridiculous. And they're and not then, fresh, which is the point of an not herb. they're fresh. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I just thought of that. No, it's true. <laughs> like, and if I wanted dry herbs, you can grow them and dry them yourself. They're super easy. All you do is take a little, you know, those sandwich bags, the the paper ones, mm-hmm. or you can even use a grocery bag, like a, um, a paper grocery bag, and you just leave them in there, crumple it up, and they'll dry out right there. Or you can hang them upside down, and it's so easy to dry them. And it's like, I can do this for, what, like a dollar for a pack of seeds? Whereas if you go to the store, you're paying like $5 for a little glass jar of, you know, herbs you had no control over making and there's tax added on to that. Like the cost alone is worth doing it yourself. And they grow like weeds. Yeah, they grow so fast. Like you will be so sick of it just planting a handful of (laughs) seeds. You'll be like, I have too many herbs now. Especially rosemary, like when I lived in Augusta, Georgia, my mom had this huge rosemary bush. It was enormous. I was like shocked at how big it was, but we used it so frequently because she also likes um, the sort of Mediterranean style food, lots of pastas and stuff like that. And um, we like euros. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You're speaking my language, but yeah, the <laughs> rose, I can, uh, yeah, I can attest to all that. Mm-hmm. Well, so where's, um, I guess, what? how would you recommend people get involved? Where should we start permaculture? Should we start by trying it out? Should we start by reading a book? Should we start by following you? Where, where's a good place for the novices? And I guess you not even just where we start, but what would you say is the progression? How should we start and end? I would start with whatever feels best. Honestly, if you're bold enough to start, really, it's not that hard. It, Permaculture is very low maintenance in my experience. Um, It's just a lot of, you know, paying attention to the weather, making sure like your plants will tell you when they need water. (laughs) So, you know, it's pretty easy. Um, You're you're more than welcome to follow me on my blog if you want to. But I also recommend um, I can post a a list of books that I've given to Hody. Um, (laughs) 
And YouTube is a great resource too. Like I can add a list of YouTube channels. That's how I came about permaculture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I follow this blog called Suburban Homestead. Changed my life forever. He calls it polyculture, which is the same thing. But his garden is so beautiful and lush. And he does that same chop and drop method and the no dig method. And his he has a front yard garden, which in some places is illegal which I'm salty about. <laughs> I'm salty about it, but it's, as it is. You illegal. should be as you should. Yeah. Be. Right. I think that's disgusting. Why? And like, it, can you help I, me? I have no idea why it's probably an HOA thing. Okay. I'm very anti HOA and they're like, they want everything to look corporate and perfect. And you know, we what, buy is, what is more perfect than unlimited amounts of food and herbs in front of somebody's house? Right? They're pretty. Right. That's so cool. And in, so I follow another guy. His name is Jim Ko Kowaleski. And uh, he doesn't have a channel of his own that I know of, but he is on one of the channels I'll recommend. I'll put it in the comments. But he has property in Costa Rica, and they don't care. They're like, do what you want with your garden. So he has... His entire front yard is nothing but edible plants. Like, I mean, the whole property is nothing but edible plants. But as soon as you drive up to his driveway, everything is edible as far as you can see. Mm -hmm. And his neighbors have actually reached out to him and been like, hey, can you do this for us too? And he does. He gardens the whole street, everybody's front yard. And it's, it's so amazing to watch, like... He's so knowledgeable and I, I just learned so much from when he guest stars on that, on the channel that I watch. And I, again, I'll post it in the comments, but it's amazing to watch. And he's so humble and willing to share information and his experience and things like that. And it's really inspiring to me to see that. So well, I kind of, and Costa on Rica, <laughs> you're kind of dealing with, uh, that's the Northern Triangle. You're dealing with a lot of food problems and food shortages, as well mm -hmm. as banana republics and puppet <laughs> governments and all kinds of problems there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I imagine that that's just, I can absolutely see why his neighbors asked if you would do that for me as well, because they're in a, yeah. they're in a rough place as far as food goes. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, and I guess that's my last point is it's really self-protectionism as well. I just say mm -hmm. I, I would like to live and I would like to <laughs> control that, you know, I think, yeah. when, I mean, we so often, and, and we talked about this on the podcast the other day, but the, the, when you trust somebody else to do the magic part for you, when you say, I don't know how this steak got to my plate, I'm just going to assume it's <laughs> magic. I paid this guy $20, that you just want as few magic portions as possible. And I think that permaculture absolutely helps cut down on the magician work that goes into growing plants. You think yeah. you need a corporate giant to, to do it for you. You really don't. It's so easy. You really don't. You and don't even need a yard. You can have a windowsill. <laughs> yeah. And I got you herbs do. for days on my windowsill. Yeah. I have green onions growing on my windowsill. Oh. <laughs> so. Fresh green onions are the best. They're so. the best. They're so good in <laughs> salads and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's even if you, it, so if you don't want to do like, if you didn't want to start from seed with everything, there are also methods to regrow produce you buy at the store. I bought those green onions from Safeway. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, because like we're going to put them in the garden, but so we bought, instead of growing them from seed, you can actually propagate plant, a lot of plants like lettuce, just stick it in some water and it will start to grow roots and you can put it in the ground and keep chopping little lettuce leaves off and um, just stuff like that. There's ways to propagate plants that you buy in the store if, you, if you're if you not comfortable growing completely from seed. But I really do want to encourage people to grow from seed and try it out and see what you think. Or, you know, if you need an example you're more than welcome to follow me. You're more than welcome to um, check out some really good YouTubers, read some books about it. Like it's really something like if we're, because I, I use the term agorist to describe my, I guess, apolitical uh, affiliation. <laughs> my, the term, the label I like is agorism. And, yeah. and one of those solutions is, 
to get off of the government and off of the subsidized farms. We want to move away from that and start providing for ourselves. If we're going to live without a government, if that's ever going to be possible, or even if the government gets smaller, whatever, we're going to need a way to provide food for ourselves. And this is a great way to do it. It's very efficient. It's very easy. And um, I want to show people how easy it is, you know? Yeah. That, that, so. Very noble. No, uh, if you're worried, wondering what agorism is, I've had Nick Irwin, Dave Valentine on this show before uh, talking about it. So just feel free to look up that episode, uh, dear listener. Um, Eric, is there anything that you feel that you would like to address more at the moment? That's just burning. We say, oh, we didn't get to it. Now's your chance. Um, I don't think so. I think that I think we covered everything. Right. Um, I mean, maybe throwing out some extra ideas like uh, manifestations there are um, if you want some keywords to google um, manifestations google. a really big word help me out with that oh um like ways that this could be executed so oh, okay um, okay I, i'm a theologian and so when i think of manifestations i start thinking of deities uh, <laughs> no, like um ways that this ways that you could execute it would be like um hugel culture um, you could do no dig method. You can do um, potager gardens is really popular in France where you combine um, like beautiful flowers and plants that are just really aesthetically pleasing. They, if you combine that with vegetable gardening, they actually benefit each other very well and can adjust nutrients level so that they both benefit really um, a, a good bit. So um looking into things like using gray water. Um, I just read earlier about this guy that uses gray water. It's like, I believe it's his, his shower, the water that comes out after he showers or whatever, that water gets used on the plants. And um, yeah, you got to use a special soap for it. I actually have used mm -hmm. a gray, uh, gray water shower before, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting how, you can reuse water because I was, I was looking into, um, what are they called? Those, those houses, I can't remember, but I can see it in my head, but they're those houses that are super sustainable. And I believe they're made at, like cob houses and, um, I can't, they're really popular. I have to, I'll post in the comments what it's called, sure. but, um, it's this specific type of house and they use the water that comes from that house. They can use it like four or five different uses, so anything that comes out of the shower gets used on this garden bed and then it gets what drains off of the soil in this indoor garden bed gets used on the outdoor garden bed and then that garden bed and they use it forever and it's really interesting to me and I don't I don't believe they have any sort of special uh, filtration system it's just it falls down they collect rainwater it goes to the shower it goes to the toilet it goes to the garden mm -hmm. and it's really it's really neat and it saves water it gets the job done i'm about it <laughs> yeah and and uh it, i think the it's scary because you think you see the big gardens and you're scared of it but you don't need a big one to do it on a very small scale you know if mm -hmm. you're just trying to feed yourself or your and your family you can do it in a windowsill and a small mm -hmm. patch of land. I mean, you could, you, you really don't, it doesn't require an awful lot. And it's not very invasive. So while I think people like me, when I first hear about it, are, are scared to try because you just say, oh, this sounds difficult. This is going to be a lot of work. I'm going to have to spend $800 at Home Depot. And then I'm going to have, it's <laughs> like, oh man, like you're really, you know, if you have a windowsill, you can start. And then you mm -hmm. can keep, and then if you want to keep going, you can keep going. But it really is as small as just sustaining yourself, medium yeah. size, just sustaining your family. And then if you really want to get large, then go ahead and get large, but there's no pressure. There's no, that's not necessarily the end game, you know, you, right. can, you know, you don't have to be afraid of getting that far and then just be like, well, I guess I'm going to garden for my whole life. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty simple. Well, even if it, even if it helps, you know, you can start with conventional gardening methods. If, if you've never gardened before, you can start with conventional gardening methods, get your feet wet with, gardening and getting your hands dirty and um, just make little switches in how you do things. So maybe one gardening season, you're going to switch up where you get your water from. Maybe the next one, you switch up how you structure the bed 
uh, maybe the next one you switch out what kind of mulch you're using. So making, you can even do it in a slow transition if you need to, just to make it more comfortable. And you can play around with things like hydroponics. That's where I started. I, my grandparents, I was introduced to gardening from my grandparents. They did the conventional rows and, you know, tilling and chemical fertilizers and things like that. And they had a beautiful garden, but that's what got me used to getting my hands dirty and, you know, being around a garden in general, it will help a lot. So if you need to start with a conventional gardening method, start there and slowly work your way into a permaculture sort of structure. Yeah. The more you learn, the more excited you get. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and it is exciting. Like it, there's the sense of fulfillment and everything. I, I actually did the hydroponics for the first time this year, uh, just to to survive the winter. You know, we're in mm-hmm. we're in Utah, and so things get a little frosty outside. Yeah. Uh, even on my sill, we have uh, we have dill and the basil I told you about, and mm-hmm. the and parsley, and all those are just hydroponics, and they're really easy. And and even in just one plant, you get enough for a meal every. I don't want to claim weekly, but about weekly on most of them, you can, you can get a meal out of them. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up. Now something we do on We're Libertarians, we always give uh, the guests just a, a final, final word. So any final words from you? Um, well, I hope you guys are more interested in checking out permaculture. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm here to help. And, um, you can check out my blog if you want to. It's Earth Nerd Anarchist. And, um, the Earth the Nerd Anarchist. Earth Nerd Anarchist, yeah. <laughs> so you're more than welcome to check that out. Um, I post every Sunday at 1, and minus last week because I had uh, the flu. <laughs> yeah, but we got two this week. So, yeah, was, we got so two you, this made week. Up, you made up for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to make it worth it. So, um, but yeah, you're more than welcome to come check out my blog. Um, also, I'll post those um, YouTube channels and the books that I recommend down below. So, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm here to help. Awesome. Uh, Erica, mm-hmm. thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show and to meet you in person. Uh, go <laughs> permaculture, go. I guess that's about my <laughs> final word. She, I, this is something I'm a novice on, and this is why I brought the expert on the show. And so I'd love to give you some extensive final words. But uh, you know, I, I would just, I would just say for me, just take the magic out of your life. Try it out. You will be surprised. I, uh, I always felt like it would be difficult, and my picture of gardening was seeing people struggle with it. And then after practicing it, and yeah, you know, your first couple times, you, you don't realize a, a few things. You learn about your yard or something that grows better in your area specifically, or you learn about Utah and how the cold happens. And so starting <laughs> planting things in September maybe isn't your best bet, but you learn and you, and you and you progress and you really get into, it's really a better product and it really takes no work. And yeah. for me, it, 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 I cook all the time. And so obviously it's valuable for me to never have to go to Walmart for herbs ever again. Right. (laughs) But, but even if you only do it sometimes, you just want to say, Hey, this calls for dill. Well, I'm going to try some fresh dill, dude. There's nothing like it. And it really is going to hype it up. It's going to make it that much better. Uh, Even if you don't plan on using it yourself, you say, I don't make anything. You can (laughs) sell it for way, way cheaper than what Walmart sells it and yeah. still make a profit off of it. I mean, there's just no, there's really no end. So just try it out, guys. Uh, liberate yourselves, liberate your brains, get involved in some permaculture. Erica's told yeah. her how, how she can, how you can find her. Uh, and she's a, she's a delight to talk to. She posts uh, very, Thank you. very philosophical questions and very open philosophical questions. So if you are in the mood for a deep conversation, she's a good one to follow. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Again, uh, do- donate on Patreon if you like the show. That's how we keep alive, everybody. Patreon.com slash We Are Libertarians. <laughs> uh, the Earth Nerd Anarchist.home.blog. And we will talk to you later. <laughs>